Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, a tumultuous week in Washington politics. What is the latest on the Kavanaugh hearings? How have Utah's leaders weighed in? And could this affect November's elections? In Utah, the Love and McAdams campaigns launch more attack ads. How are Utahns reacting to the negative campaign tactics? New developments in the debate over medical marijuana. How are opinions shifting? And what local issues are dominating the headlines? Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Heidi Hatch, anchor and reporter with KUTV, Ben Winslow, reporter with Fox 13, and Matt Canham, senior managing editor of the Salt Lake Tribune. So glad to have you all with us tonight. I want to jump into some some really interesting things we've been having in politics, particularly just yesterday, as the whole nation really tuned in to watch the hearing of uh, two people testifying uh, about sexual assault allegations. In particular, four women have accused Judge Kavanaugh of sexual impropriety. One in particular, uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, uh, spent a lot of time yesterday talking about the incident that happened. I want to talk about the process itself and what happened in this hearing. Matt, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, how, how unprecedented is a hearing like this and when what happened? It's incredibly unprecedented. And what you had is a Supreme Court confirmation hearing, which this country has had many times over. It was done a couple weeks ago. And then new allegations came out, leaked uh, information, got into the media, created a firestorm of this allegation from Dr. Ford and led to this additional hearing this high stakes uh, drama that we saw yesterday that was really painful to watch throughout the whole day. It was just incredibly tense and emotional for all sides and honestly uh, felt like theater more than reality. Well, is that what this was? Ben, you were watching so closely. It was this kind of theater. What was the ultimate objective of this? Because th there's a lot of testimony here. There were tears. There were very difficult stories to hear. And there was also a lot of anger. Well, yes and no, it was theater. I mean, there was a sense of political theater, but also this is very real to both of these people. And you saw that in their testimony. Uh, Dr. Ford's testimony, everybody couldn't turn away from it. And then you have Judge Kavanaugh who came out who was uh, very, I don't know if you'd say impassioned, angry, all, you know, all on full display. And you saw uh, the polarization of politics and the polarization of America right now all in that one room. And I think I mean theater more from the Senate perspective rather than the individuals who are at the core of this conversation. That this was a scripted day mm -hmm. where the outcome was never really in doubt. That people didn't seem to take, they, they had preconceived notions. They believed the credibility of the person they wanted to believe from the start to the end. Uh, even though the testimony was obviously very raw. I think that was part of the problem when you were watching. It was so sad, so emotional, and I couldn't stand to go on social media because everyone wanted to be vindicated by what their side said. And I think, unfortunately, right now, we've weaponized women, especially women who come forward, and whether Democrats or Republicans wanted to admit it, Democrats held her in their pocket too long. They were probably excited when she called. It was a very sad situation, but they wanted to use her for their gain. And then Republicans on their end were using it to their extent where they didn't want an investigation. And I think watching this play out just shows you where our country's at. Was this rock bottom for us? Have we not hit it yet? But I mean, C-SPAN is not usually fun to watch, but I mean, days like yesterday, C-SPAN's yeah. great again. I why, mean, you couldn't turn away. Why do you think so many people were tuned into this one? Because they were all across the country, totally in the state. People are watching this. I think here in Utah, people who otherwise would not have voted for Donald Trump voted for him because they felt so strongly about Supreme Court nominees. And so I think they're watching this because everyone has a stake in this. It's something that's for life. And I think in some aspects, while everyone wanted their side to say what they wanted, I think there was... I mean, a real intent by people wanting to know what happened. It's important. This is someone who's going to make decisions that last for a very long time in our country. So there was a lot at stake. And I think that 
<clears throat> it, there's something to be said for just the, the overall impact of, of what it speaks, like Heidi said, what it speaks to what's happening in our country right now. And e all sides wanted to see how this plays out and, and the vindication, whether they felt vindicated or not. Um, you're looking for this aha moment, and there were so many of those, and it, it was almost law and order, Supreme Court edition, and, and this is going to be one of the most powerful lifetime appointments for decades to come, and so the stakes are so high. Yeah. And even the average voter can't really turn away from that. And at the core of it is this human drama. A woman who's not well known, who's just lived her life, who is thrust into such incredible pressure to tell something that was obviously very painful for her. Uh, you could, anyone could see themselves in putting that role and how crushingly the pressure would be in that moment. She described herself as terrified, and I think any of us would have been terrified in that moment. And I think that you have not only the political ramifications, you have that cross with the political ramifications and the Me Too movement was happening nationwide socially, and we can all relate to someone who's put in that uh, position. And I thought that uh, she was a very compelling and credible witness. I thought she handled herself very well uh, under that level of spotlight. Mm -hmm. Let, let's take these, this great analysis and put kind of this, this political perspective that you all talked about here, that this was at the heart of some of this as well. And I want to read a quote from our own Senator Mike Lee about this and see what you think. He said, today's hearing was heart wrenching. Despite deliberate obstruction of that investigation by committee Democrats, we now have sworn statements from all those named by Dr. Ford at the alleged incident. None of them remembers the incident ever happening. I believe Dr. Ford was the victim of a crime. I do not believe Judge Kavanaugh committed it. And no corroborating evidence suggests he did. Judge Kavanaugh has my vote. Heidi, let's talk about, there's a lot in that right there. Let's talk, let's talk about this obstruction allegation, which was echoed by many Republicans in that, in that hearing. Well, I think there is a lot to take from it, and I think Senator Lee wasn't the only Republican who said this, and I think a lot of people did walk away from this feeling like both witnesses, whether you're talking about uh, Judge Kavanaugh or Dr. Ford, really believed what they were saying, and the question is that we may never know exactly what happened, but when they don't have proof, I think Republicans are up against a gun right now where they feel like they have to make a decision timing-wise, and I think when they're looking at the calendar here, maybe choices they would make differently at a different time of year are not happening. And so I think Senator Lee is trying to go with what he saw. And I think that Republicans felt like they could go forward and vote for Kavanaugh after they saw him talk about his life as a family man and what he's done throughout his career, which he kept going back to. The question goes back to all that drinking he did, and he seemed to do a lot of drinking as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Let's get to this timing aspect that you just mentioned as well. Uh, Matt, explain that for a minute. Why is the timing of this so important? Right, so we are getting near our election, and this midterm, the House and Senate are at stake. The Republicans, if you look at the forecast, Republicans right now are expected to lose the House. It's, they have a better than not chance of keeping the Senate, but there's still probably a one in three chance that the Republicans can lose the Senate. So let's say that um, Judge Kavanaugh steps aside or Trump withdraws his nomination. Then there would be a new nominee comes up. Then they have to go through this whole process again of getting documents, doing interviews at the Senate, mm -hmm. getting everything ready, do another hearing. Does that happen before the end of the year? And if not, no way. if you lose yeah. the Senate, Mm -hmm. and you can't get another nominee through, as, as Ben and Heidi already talked about, this is the key vote on the Supreme Court. This is the swing vote. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Republican and you want control of the Supreme Court for decades, this is the time. And you'll look past things you might not look past if it was April or May where you had enough time and say, look, whether this is, you know, we don't know we can't say definitively what happened 35 years ago, but we do not feel comfortable with this nominee. We're going to try someone else. If you say that now, it has bigger political ramifications. It does. Ben, talk about this aspect a little too, because a lot of the Democrats are remembering what happened to their own candidate, Merrick Garland, right? Is this, a, is this exactly what happened to them that they are doing now in, in the minds of some? I don't know if you could say that all the way, but they're certainly in that, that viewpoint that you know, they, the, the Supreme Court of the Senate had a chance to consider Merrick Garland and in their mind actively obstructed, Senate Republicans did, to keep him from even being considered. Um, so some view it as tit for tat. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I don't know if that's the case, but that is certainly how it's perceived. And, and like Matt said, there's also this, we have a midterm coming up. We need to get this done. I asked Orrin Hatch about Merrick Garland. You know, you're, you're pushing Judge Kavanaugh very, very hard uh, to get this confirmed. And he said, well, that, what about Merrick Garland? And he said, well, that was different. That was presidential year. It is the president's prerogative. It was coming up, you know, so he views it very differently as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it is or is not, I mean, that's certainly how it's perceived. And it speaks to also the tribalism that is taking place right now. Yeah, absolutely right. Heidi, where do we go from here? I mean, t this is a, a brand new uh, stage for us right here. We're not seeing anything like this. Where do we go? Where do we go as a country, as people, as we look at our candidates, but also the politics just generally? I hope we all take a look at ourselves when you watch what happened there. And I hope we all take a step back and learn from this. I don't know if that will happen, but in our own personal lives, how we deal with other people, how we act from the day that we're teenagers on up, how we treat each other on social media, I don't think it's going to stop, but it just keeps getting nastier and nastier. And this is not a way I'd like to raise my kids in a world like this. I, especially when you look at the Supreme Court, when you look at our founding fathers, they didn't want this to be political. And we used to be able to reach across the aisle. Even Senator Hatch years ago was good at working with Senator Kennedy and all of that is gone and I don't know what it's going to take if it is hitting that rock bottom where we can build ourselves back up but we're not headed down a good road right now mm -hmm. and so I hope there's a good way forward I just don't know where. If you look at Orrin Hatch and just through his 42 years on the Senate uh, if you go back to the Clinton years he voted for Ruth Bader Ginsburg he voted for Stephen Breyer if I recall Ruth Bader Ginsburg had more than 90 votes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's impossible in today's politics. Yeah. Now, in this unique circumstance, uh, Judge Kavanaugh's final vote is right now slated for Tuesday, and it appears that if he gets confirmed, it will be with 50 or 51 votes, the lowest margin ever for a Supreme Court justice to be confirmed. That's where we are right now. Part if of he gets confirmed. If he yeah. gets confirmed. Uh, that vote is on Tuesday, so we'll be watching that closely. We'll, of course, know very soon whether or not uh, the nomination goes forward from this committee. Let's switch gears for just a moment. Uh, our, our congressional district races are just so interesting. The fourth congressional district, Mia, Mia Love, Ben McAdams. <clears throat> there's been a lot of, there's been quite a week of stuff being thrown back yes. and forth. Yeah. Ben, <laughs> ben, let's start with you, okay? So this campaign, both these campaigns have become pretty negative. It's, it's a close race, too. Is, is that the reason why? I think that's why. Is we need to put seeing... McAdams back in the shower. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you didn't love that commercial? No. Oh. So horrible. <laughs> but you, you, that is exactly, it is a close race. This is the closest Utah has to a swing district. And so the gloves eventually will come off. And this is what you're seeing, especially in these cru crucial, what, 40 days till mm -hmm. election day? Days. Ballots are getting mailed out next week. You're going to start seeing uh, it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Heidi, this is such an interesting point that Ben brought up, too, because it used to be before all we had mail-in ballots, which yeah. are just coming out. Everyone's going to start seeing them in the, in the next few days. Um, we used to wait for a while, right? The negative yeah. ads came out a little closer to the end when show, people showed up in November. Uh, how is how is the kind of the melon voting really changing how quickly these negative things start? Yeah, they have to because people can start voting soon. I, it'll be interesting to see if people hold off. But I think people kind of have their minds made up in this race. And the gross part is, is the money that's being spent is from their actual campaigns right now. I asked our station and no PAC money's come in at this point. So it's going to get worse down the road. But even though this is a close race, I feel like when people vote locally in politics, there were people who were Republicans more likely to vote for McAdams, mm -hmm. maybe on a local level because we are so saturated with one party here. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people tend to be more partisan when they vote their national politics. So I think people are largely going to have their mind made up and vote very soon. But there are a few people that are on the line. They're going to wait and they're going to get some nasty ads between now and then. I mean, I hated the shower commercials, but I'm begging for those back now because it's just bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is an interesting race in the sense that it's not about an issue, it's about reputations. Yeah. There's no issue at the core of this race that I can see. Mm -hmm. It's about which person do you feel best about? And they're fighting over a very small group of voters. And I think, as Ben said, there's one easy way to identify if a race is close, if the incumbent is doing negative ads. Yeah. If an incumbent is doing negative ads, they are afraid that they might lose, mm -hmm. which is why we don't see it in Utah that often. And, and it's the only race we are seeing it. It's because it's playing defense. It's trying to make the, those undecided voters, that very narrow group, 
that will decide whether they're gonna swing one party or the other to like the other candidate less than they like yeah. you. Yeah. Ben, does it work ultimately? You tell voters it seems recoil from negative ads. We tend to clutch our pearls and say, <laughs> oh my, that's that's not good. Um, and, and I don't know if they work all the time. Um, you certainly, the candidate will always say, well, I'm not going negative. I'm just highlighting mm -hmm. an issue that voters should be concerned about. We still sometimes view it as negative, and usually in past campaigns, regardless Democrat, Republican, regardless of the candidate, they've left it to the outside groups to do their dirty work. Um, that's not happening, as Heidi said, here so far. But uh, overall, I think I don't, I don't. Whenever I talk to voters, they say they don't like negative ads, which surprises me that every now and then we'll still see negative ads. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how, oh, go ahead, Heidi. Well, I was going to say people also tell us when we do surveys about news that they don't like news that bleeds. They don't want to hear about murders. They don't want to hear about the bad things. They only want to hear happy things, but that's the exact opposite too when you look at what they watch. People do want to see the bad things. So I do think as much as we don't like it and it's aggravating to hear on TV, those ads do plant seeds and those seeds of doubt are what they're probably after in a race like this because Mia Love didn't do some things people wanted to see in her district. She didn't go out there and have town halls. She didn't sit down with them in large groups, which people wanted. And now it's making up for lost time. Mm -hmm. Well, how effective is it to start to paint the, paint the brush like by who they might be like, right? So some of those commercials are like, you know, the, Bill Clinton loves Ben McAdams. Right. That was one of the commercials, right? Yeah. Th thanking him, that was for, you know, the, or the Kennedys. Does that, right. does that stuff matter? Does that, that have an impact? Do people really say those associations work? These are high dollar campaigns who get really expensive Expensive consultants to tell them what works. So those consultants at least believe that it works. And I think that we see it on both sides. Uh, ben McAdams has an ad where he makes sure that Mia Love is with Donald Trump in that ad. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at this race, the Republicans, and not just in this race, but Republicans nationwide are using Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton as the boogeyman still, Nancy Pelosi to some effect. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is uh, unpopular in the fourth district, more than yeah. in any other part of our state. And that's part of the reason that Ben McAdams is running against Mia Love and not in another area of our state. He doesn't actually live in that district. He's running because this is the most obtainable win. And Mia Love, uh, back to the negative ad thing, Mia Love's negatives, negative percentage of how people approve of her is higher than our other elected officials. Yeah. And I would argue that part of that is because she's had more close races, she's been attacked more, mm -hmm. and people kind of remember some of those things, those seeds that's, that are planted. Yeah, that's what Heidi talked about, that's exactly exactly it. Uh, there is an issue that's even pre prevalent in that particular race on medical marijuana. Right. We need to talk about that because there's some developments this, this week. Ben, I know you've been following those too, so some meetings have been happening on the Hill. So many meetings. T tell us about those, <laughs> you've been covering them. little meetings. Um, Covering them is a way, an interesting way of putting it, trying to find out what is happening in those mm -hmm. meetings because no one will go step in front of a camera to say this is what is going on. There are, they all confirm, yes, we are talking. Uh, the speaker characterizes it as discussions that are taking place. But what it appears that is happening is everybody's trying to come up with some kind of a, a compromise bill, some kind of an omnibus medical marijuana bill that tries to make everyone happy. It's a bill that essentially, if proper Proposition two passes, does cleanup. If proposition two fails, it makes good. And essentially, there would be some kind of a medical cannabis program. At least that's what it's sounding like on some level with, of course, heavy regulations. Uh, this is, a, from what I understand, discussions have involved the Prop 2 people. It has involved the LDS Church. It has involved all of these different groups in a way of trying to find some kind of compromise. Of course, supporters of Proposition 2 say, well, where were you five years ago when we have been discussing this time and again in the legislature, which is why we have a ballot initiative now, is because the legislature failed to address this in any kind of meaningful way. But it appears that this ballot initiative has gotten everybody's attention. It is poised to pass still with polling. And so that's why we are where we are. Mm -hmm. so, so let's talk about the strategy here for a second, Heidi. So if if everyone's coming together saying we are going to do something is so, so well articulated by Ben, right? Is, is that going to kill this thing? Is that the intention of this? Of, of, I think of, the LDS Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons, or whatever we're calling this week, if you have to say the full name. I think that they know that within their own membership, there is a great response of people who want to vote for this. But I think they also know that when they come out and ask people 
to vote for something or not to vote to something, people will listen. And I think they feel like if they can get this 11th hour plan and they feel like they can tell enough people, hey, we've got a plan, we're going to make this work, just trust us here, that they could possibly get enough people not to vote for it. And I think it is possible, and I think they've got to have a good enough backup plan. The question is, can they get that backup plan fast enough and convince enough people? Because I think it's swung in the direction at this point where most people see the opioid addiction in our state and all the other problems that go with it, and they want another option. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those issues where voters may have largely already made up their minds now. Yeah. And while the church is nicking away at the support and their little cuts uh, away at the support, you see the polls and it does drop a little bit. Um, voters overall may have already said, well, this is how I feel about it. And this is also an issue that drives people to the polls like nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Pot drives polls. And so. <laughs> I think that you're going to see, and this could affect all these other races, 4th Congressional District, all of 2nd uh, Congressional District, all of these ones where you may see a little bit of surprises uh, because this is an issue where people who don't normally vote in elections will turn out for a single issue. Mm -hmm. Matt, last point on this. Uh, let's take a hypothetical. Uh, the, the public believes that something is going to happen. Right. And so they, they show up and they, don't, they vote against the proposition. All right. Tell us what happens after that, right? So if, if it does fail, are legislators going to feel compelled, do you believe, to institute a bunch of things that they find acceptable there, or is, are people just kind of begging for scraps after that? Well, but see, and that's part of the argument, right? If you're a Prop 2 uh, supporter right now, you're saying, if you want to make sure there's a medical marijuana law, this is the only way to do it. Vote for this, and it will happen definitively. What the LDS Church uh, leaders are trying to say is, we promise we will push for a special session before the end of the year if you defeat this. Now, I believe that they'll hold up their end of the bargain, at least publicly. Uh, there are these efforts to draft a bill, but, which is why there are these meetings that Ben's talking about. Okay, if you're gonna have a special session, what are you passing? What is your proposal? And right now, the uh, anti-Prop 2 people don't have a proposal on the table. They have nothing to point to. That's why they're trying to get something. Uh, I think we've cross the point where in this state we will have medical marijuana. Now we already have a very, very limited program for people who in the last six months of their life, which is still getting worked through the regulatory process. We're gonna have a full-fledged medical marijuana proposal, but right now there's something to look at and debate the details. What's happening now in secret are the key parts of what those details are. What are we, what are we voting on? Like, what is, your, what is the counter? Is people who have intractable pain going to be a part of it? Because if you look at medical marijuana across the country, lots of people take it because they have chronic, chronic pain, say back problems or something like that. Well, there are certain people who are concerned that that's easily abused. Is that going to be in this compromise bill? We don't know. And we might not know before people vote. Okay, uh, we have to leave it on that because I want to take a minute to talk about an amendment we'll be voting on in November that almost no one's really talking about, right? Oh, amendment yes. C. Mm -hmm. Amend of course, Amendment C, <laughs> which allows the legislature, because I want to get the words right, because it was really important, allows the legislature to call themselves into special session to address, this is it, fiscal crisis, war, natural disaster, or emergency in the f affairs of states. That's a pretty broad definition. Yeah. What is emergency in the affairs of state? What does it mean? What is a fiscal crisis? It could be anything that involves well, money. Heidi, they, yeah. s they sound suspicious. It is very broad based. <laughs> I know at first it just sounds like, oh, you'll never need that. That's going, you know, the War zombies come eat our faces off or whatever. This is for like worst case scenario, but it's in there for a reason. We don't know the reason, and that's what makes us nervous, and I guess should make us nervous. Well, let's speculate then. Matt, you saw this last legislative session, yeah. and Ben, I saw you up there the whole time too. All right. What is the reason for this? Why does the legislator said we think we should be able to call ourselves in the session? Because the governor won't do it and we want him to do it and so we're gonna do it ourselves. You look at this year where we have multiple ballot measures, you know, the legislature could have tried to short circuit them even more one at a time earlier if they could call themselves into special session and the governor refused. And you could say that that's a fiscal issue. You could say it's some other, you know, crisis of state affairs. You can use this very easily. We also have a very one-sided legislature. So while there's a high vote threshold, the Republicans can do that on their own. Mm -hmm. How, let's just take an issue of the day. Uh, let's say medical marijuana. 
I mean, is, is the, they've been trying to negotiate with the governor, the legislature yeah. has, whether or not they call them to special session. Ben, does this open up the window for something like that? It could potentially. I mean, they've been trying to get the governor to call a special session, at least opponents of Proposition 2 did meet with the governor in hopes of trying to get something going. The governor refused because he it, it appears he did not want the wrath of voters. Mm -hmm. So he said there will be no special session before November to deal with this particular issue. Constitutional Amendment C, hypothetically for a situation like this, could allow the legislature to call itself into special session if they have a plan, pass a bill. Now, their argument is also, look, the governor still has the veto power. So we're not necessarily taking power from the governor. He still can mm -hmm. say, nope, don't like it, veto. Uh, you, it gives you, them more power, though. They but it does yeah. give them something yeah. that they yeah. don't have right now. So, so, so Matt, uh, so the governor's clearly opposed to this. Right. Uh, he said, he said that, he, that he is. Um, give, just give us the politics of this for, for just a moment. With, with him being opposed, does his veto power really protect as an appropriate offset of what the legislature wants to have here? I mean, this is a constitutional amendment for a reason. We have a constitution where this separation of power was put in there. It makes sense that different bodies of uh, government will fight for each other for power. But the politics of it, the individual voter, when they read those words, where do they go? We don't have a great handle on that. Will they look at this as getting rid of a check and balance? Will they look at this as allowing the people closer to individual voters to be empowered to make the decisions for them? I don't know. Um, my hunch is that people will be cautious and this won't pass, but it's just a hunch. It could. It, it, I could be totally wrong. <laughs> Are you ever, though, really? <laughs> a lot of people skip that on the ballot. Sometimes if they don't understand it or fully, I think they just, no bubble in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so we're going to have to end it with that one, but we need to talk more about that one as well. Thank you so much for your comments today. Very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this edition of the Hinkley Report. For more on this week's news, visit us online at KUED.org slash Hinkley Report. Thank you and good night.